I think we can all agree that the advent of the Internet and the information superhighway has simplified daily life for just about everybody who is able to afford it. From the essential functions of paying your bills, checking your bank account, communicating with family and friends through social media, and yes, even exercising your mind and your clicking muscle through a plethora of games, videos, and quality homegrown community radio stations such as this one. In 2011, when Bashar al-Assad cut off internet access to Syria, the United Nations jumped in and said disconnecting people from the internet was a human rights violation. Now I know what you're saying, Skeeter. Why are you going to turn political about the internet? We all like the internet. Shut up and play REM or something. Well, not to burst your bubble, but I'm not the one that is turning it political. I trace the moment the internet started a steep road to politicization to when the term net neutrality was born back in 2003. And no, it wasn't Al Gore's global warming hating Heine that came up with it. Net neutrality is the concept that every website be accessed equally and freely without internet service providers giving preferential treatment to certain sites or content. As has been the case since the beginnings of commercial usage of the internet, regardless of what speed or cost your signal is, you're able to access any website you want. Opponents of the philosophy of net neutrality, which include not just Republicans and conservatives, but the phone and cable companies, as well as the present chairman of the FCC, Ajit Pai. Opponents claim that the internet cannot be completely free and neutral saying regulations will deflate competition and infrastructure into broadband, stifling economic growth in the process as startups and content creators do not pay their fair share or pay next to nothing for the usage of broadband, wireless, and other hardware. Opponents have also criticized the 2015 reclassification of broadband to a common carrier system on that basis, despite service and carriage requiring ISPs to treat all content equally. Meantime, supporters of net neutrality, which include Democrats and, among other people, the inventor of the World Wide Web himself, Tim Berners-Lee, say lack of regulations would result in ISPs and cable companies like Comcast and Verizon to serve their services and content over that of which Verizon and other providers do not hold a personal ownership stake in. Supporters also fear that a lack of net neutrality would lead to providers implementing a tiered system of payments for overall Internet access, which could kill coverage, innovation, certain freedoms of speech, and the encouragement for small businesses and startups to set up shop online. Supporters also look to the recent repeal of Internet privacy rules, which would have prevented ISPs from selling your online data without consent to third parties for advertising as a setup for the demise of net neutrality. Supporters say this kills any sort of privacy protection, while opponents, including FCC Chairman Pai, say it does not kill already pre-existing privacy protections. One person who voted to repeal these privacy rules is Jim Sensenbrenner, born in Chicago, raised in Shorewood, Wisconsin, presently a representative of Wisconsin's 5th Congressional District just north and west of Milwaukee, a Republican hotbed. Sensenbrenner has been in that chair since 1979, and in June, he'll turn 74 years old. And if he opts to not run for a seat again, it wouldn't be a moment too soon after his response in defense of his repeal vote at a town hall last week. His response was, quote, Nobody's got to use the Internet. And the thing is that if you start regulating the Internet like a utility, if we did that right at the beginning, we would have no Internet. Sure, just like urban townships would have to borrow well water or just wait for the Ark to start filling up. But not before we roast our s'mores in manually lit bonfires, because the propane and kerosene prices would be just too much of a skyrocket for the wallet. He continued by saying that, quote, Internet companies have invested an awful lot of money in having almost universal service now. And with that investment is also pursued a plethora of assets. For Comcast, Universal Pictures, and the networks of NBC, MSNBC, USA, E, Bravo, and the like. 
AT&T has a broadband subscription service offered through DirecTV, which means the rights to NFL Sunday Ticket to come with it. AT&T is also looking to merge with Time Warner, a separate entity than Time Warner Cable, which was purchased last year by another cable company, Charter Communications, now rebranded in Time Warner Cable Markets as Spectrum. And pursuant unto those overlords is the ability to promote and, with lack of oversight, flaunt their specific offerings. Competition would be aggressively replaced with rooster blocking, all the while leaving those outside the financial and competitive realm without the resources to promote, produce, and present their services. Wikipedia and other free encyclopedias would slowly cease to exist. Educating yourself online would come at a premium. Alongside increased ad space being sold at your expense, the cost to get as much content as you wish would also go up, and those wishing to present their worldview or public service would be left out in the cold unless they could afford to pay an added or hidden fee. The usage of Skype or Facebook video call would be charged similarly to a landline call. Streaming Netflix could also come at a big price depending on your data plan. And unless you subscribe to a possible bundle package that included a landline phone to go with your cable TV and internet all rolled into one, your bills could spike for the sake of receiving a higher quality service. Now these are just some of the arguments and concerns passed along by supporters of a regulated but open and neutral internet. And as close to 4 million citizens let be known three years ago at the unveiling of net neutrality rules drafted by the FCC, an overwhelming majority of web users are on the side of a consumer-friendly and consumer-protected World Wide Web, where all lanes are treated the same, where everyone can communicate freely with each other, and where big corporations are neutered in their pursuit of getting the most out of a customer's savings than of their entertainment value. If it wasn't for the Internet, I wouldn't be able to contact my friends on a daily basis and especially my sweetie April up in Chicago, since we aren't much in the way of phone people. If it wasn't for the Internet, I would not be able to reach out and search for job opportunities, nor would I have been able to receive this platform and a chance to reach out to those of you listening. If it wasn't for the Internet, you would also not be afforded the chance to listen to this show or this station and all of its corresponding programming. Nor would you be able to witness the world and the happenings within at almost a first-hand, bird's-eye, compact angle, and to be able to share your specific angle with someone else, be they 10 feet, 10 miles, 100, or even 1,000 from you. Should the Internet be considered a human right? Yes. Should there be some concessions made in terms of consumers' investment in infrastructure and expansion of service to rural areas? Yes. Should Internet service providers lessen their threshold on grabbing specific branded content? and tighten their loose budgets on promotion and acquisition to focus on said expansion for those with lesser means and lower incomes? Yes. Get your internet service provider to stand up for a willing customer to pay for a working and open information superhighway with reasonable fees and pricing and without any extra hassle on the monthly bills. And in return, gladly shower them with whatever disposable income you have to offer. And as a reply to Representative Sensenbrenner's reply, the internet may not be water by any stretch, but it still quenches the thirst just as well. Now isn't that something we can agree on?